Today, let us take some time to study the Word of God with the sermon titled, After That Day. Once we are born on this earth, we are destined to leave this world. Then, what kind of situation will unfold after we depart from this world? God says that every action we do while we are alive and active determine our life after that day. Isn't this an extremely important teaching of the Bible? Therefore, we must never live today's life in a meaningless and indifferent manner, devoid of value. What does everyone undoubtedly have in the end? Everyone has life after that day. The day when the fate of all individuals is determined will surely come to everyone. Whether they are rich or poor, powerful or commoners, won't it? Thus, what can we say about tyrants, the persecuted, famous celebrities, and ordinary people? All are inevitably bound by the same fate of departing from this world. However, leaving this world is not the end. What matters is the situation after that day. Then, what determines our life after that day? Everything we say, think, and act at every moment while living on this earth accumulates and converges to determine our life after that day. Given this teaching of the Bible, we should never waste our life we live today on something vain. Let's take a look at the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Chapter 9 verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that too. What happens after that day? Face judgment. In the English Bible, it is written as judgment. Since it mentions judgment, let us think about it as a verdict made by a court. There will be those who will go to hell and those who will go to heaven. There will be those who will suffer forever in the burning lake of fire, and those who will enjoy eternal life and happiness forever and ever. Final destinies will be determined after that day. Everything we speak, think, and do at every moment accumulates. In Revelation, what will God do according to what we have done? Doesn't God say he will give to everyone according to what they have done? Regarding what will happen after that day, let's first examine the teachings Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago when he came to this earth and ask ourselves, from today, what kind of life should we prepare for? We must all be able to prepare for what will happen after that day. Let's take a look at the book of Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Where do we want to go after that day? It is the kingdom of heaven. Here, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Then, can't we say that living a life by doing God's will faithfully is the correct way for us to prepare for the eternal kingdom of heaven? Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In other words, who are they? Evildoers refer to those who do not keep the law of God's covenant. 
That is why in another version, it is written, away from me, you who practice lawlessness. When people's lives on this earth end and they stand before God's judgment seat, God will ask, what did you do while you were on the earth? Some will say, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name and drove out demons. I also performed many signs and wonders. What else did you do? I kept Sunday worship, worshipped the cross, and celebrated Christmas. In this way, when they lay out all the deeds of their faith before God, he will make a judgment. Depending on whether it was lawlessness or actions done according to God's will, God will judge them and cast out all those who practiced lawlessness. According to God's will, there are God's festivals, baptism, the regulation of woman wearing a veil, and many other teachings of the new covenant. Among these, let us examine the teaching that we must believe in Heavenly Mother. Today, there are as many churches around us as the sand on the seashore. If we look around the world, we can see that so many people claim to believe in God. However, in the last age of the Holy Spirit, whom should we believe in? From Genesis to Revelation, across all the 66 books of the Bible, God thoroughly explains, you must believe in God the Mother, indicating that having faith not only in God the Father but also in God the Mother fully aligns with God's will. However, although we say, Lord, Lord, if we do not do His will, can we be saved? After that day, God will determine whether we will go to heaven or hell based on how we practiced our faith while living on this earth. Since even those who say, Lord, Lord, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, needless to say, those who do not believe in God will not enter. Therefore, shouldn't all of us strive to lead all mankind to eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven through the correct faith in God the Father and God the Mother? Also, shouldn't we guide our neighbors to the truth with love? Today, churches in the world emphasize only faith in God the Father. However, the Bible enlightens us that we can reach complete faith when we believe not only in God the Father but also in God the Mother. Let's take a look at the book of Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 26, it is written, But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is. Who is she? Our mother. Isn't it clearly written, our mother? Verse 27. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of whom? Who are we children of? The free woman. Whom does the free woman, mentioned in Galatians chapter 4 refer to? The Bible clearly reminds us that Jerusalem is our mother. God's people, who have received the promise from God are called the children of the woman. Through the 66 books of the Bible, God clearly reminds us that we have God the mother. This is not the only testimony recorded in the Bible. Let us open Genesis chapter 1. 
When we fully understand the question, what is the true will of God here? We can then partake in God's promise of the kingdom of heaven after that day. Let's take a look at the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. God, who created mankind, said, Let us make mankind. Therefore, it shows that God the Creator who created mankind is not one. Let's find out what image of God exists in the category of us by turning to verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Since God created mankind in his own image, in other words, it means that he copied his image, doesn't it? After making a direct copy of God's image, who were created? Male and female were created. How did God express himself? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. He did not say that he would make mankind by himself. If it was one God who created all mankind, how should it have been expressed? I will create man by myself. At least an expression like this should have been used. However, in verse 26, God said, let us create mankind in our own likeness. And then, the forms of man and woman were created by God. What do we call that male image of God? We call him God the Father. Then, naturally, what should we call God who has the female image? Of course, we should call her God the Mother. The records of Genesis explain this matter very clearly. Yet today, all churches in the world say, there is only God the Father, not God the Mother. Then, does Genesis chapter 1 in their Bible differ from that in ours? It is the same. No matter which Bible you look at around the world, it is recorded in the same way. Nevertheless, they worship only one God, saying, God is one. The verse they most frequently use to claim, there is only one God, is from Ephesians chapter 4. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And how many gods are there? One God. If we read only this, it seems like there is only one God. However, what continues afterwards? And Father of all. How many gods do we have as our Father? Only one. There is only one God as our Father. But who else is there besides God the Father? According to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, who became as the model and origin of the female image. Then, shouldn't we call that female image of God God the Mother? It is because God the Father and God the Mother are the ones who give eternal life to mankind. This is why even from Genesis chapter 1, the Bible testified that mankind was created by God the Father and God the Mother. There are many denominations even in Korea, Presbyterian, Methodist, Holiness, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witnesses, Unification and many more. There are churches of many denominations, but the Bible is the same. It is the same in the English Bible and in the Spanish Bible. Since all the Bibles are written exactly the same, doesn't this mean we can believe in them just as they are? 
Wasn't a man created in the image of God who has masculinity and a woman created in the image of God who has femininity? Do you think God cannot distinguish between I and we? God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, and created male and female. Then, it is certain that within God exists both a God with masculinity and a God with femininity. God with masculinity created us, and God with femininity also created us. That is why God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, isn't it? Based on this, let us recall the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. Who will enter the kingdom of heaven? Only the one who does the will of God. This is the how the life after that day will be determined. Since the churches in the world today have such fallacies and contradictions even from Genesis chapter 1, Although they read the 66 books of the Bible, they inevitably come to inconsistent conclusions. All mankind desires to go to heaven. To go there, we must do the will of Father. God's will is having faith not only in God the Father, but also in whom? Our faith must encompass belief in both God the Father and God the Mother. Doesn't God let us know that only then can we be part of the heavenly family? Let's take a look at the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 9. According to verse 9, there is a father who gave birth to our physical bodies. And there is also a father who gave birth to our souls. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and life? Just as there is a Father among the members of the family system on this earth, who also exists in the spiritual world, it is written that our Father also exists. Just as there is a physical Father, there is also a spiritual Father. There are also children on this earth, aren't there? Therefore, there should also be spiritual children in the spiritual world, shouldn't there? Let's see the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. Chapter 6 verse 17. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And, I will be. Who will God be to us? a father to you, and you will be. Who will we be? My sons and daughters. Whose words are these? Says the Lord Almighty. God says, I am your father, and you are my children. Father, son, daughter, and children are titles used exclusively within a family setting. However, mother is missing here. That's why it is written in Galatians chapter 4 verse 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free, and who is she? She is our mother. Also, in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 27, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, and created male and female. This shows that God the mother surely exists. Then, the family relationship of spiritual father, mother, and sons and daughters are fully established. This is why, 2,000 years ago when God came to this earth, He taught us that we are God's children and that we are related through God's blood. All 66 books of the Bible are God's will. If we fail to correctly recognize and maintain the proper faith in these contents written as God's will, the situation we will face after that day can only be truly dire. People will say, Lord, Lord, 
Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then why won't you let us enter the kingdom of heaven? Then, God will say, I never knew you. Away from me, you who practice lawlessness. Thus, God said that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who? Those who do the will of Father. Then, is it God's will to believe in God the Mother, or not? Isn't the word, Elohim, used 2,500 times in the Old Testament? To be precise, the term, Elohim, can be translated to God's. In the original Hebrew, there clearly exists a singular noun, Eloah. Then why is God referred to as Elohim? In Korean, isn't there a letter we add at the end of a noun to turn it into a plural form? The same is true in Hebrew. To the word, Eloah, a suffix, im, is added. In English, it is like adding s to the end of a noun. From this, we can confirm that God is unequivocally not a single entity. But both God the Father and God the Mother have been together in every step from the work of creation to leading the salvation of mankind. Yet even today, many churches in the world consistently say, isn't the church that believes in God the Mother strange? Nevertheless, we should be able to examine how the Bible testifies about this matter and prepare for our salvation after that day. Everyone, how short is our human life? People in their 20s or 30s may think that the days ahead of them until their 70s or 80s are plentiful. But they pass by in the blink of an eye. It is astonishing how time flies so quickly. Two or three months pass by in a flash without even realizing it. Therefore, when we consider all these matters, our life is definitely not a long one. It is fleeting. Regarding this, the anecdote of Thomas More leaves a profound deep impact in my heart. He was sent to prison for not obeying the king's commands due to his own religious beliefs conflicting with what was demanded of him. His wife and son came to visit. The wife said, Honey, can't you just compromise your faith and say you'll follow the king's wishes? Moore said, How many years do you think I have left to live? I think you can live 20 more years. Then, should I give up eternal life for those short 20 years? He asked. Thus, he did not give in to the king. He was determined that he could not forsake his faith of following the righteous path taught by God just to prolong his life by a mere 20 years. As a result, he was eventually put to death in prison. Our human lives are this short. Even the once famous rulers and renowned conquerors are no longer among the living. Napoleon and Genghis Khan, who seemed as if they would command the whole world, also passed away. Those figures known as great men, whose names alone you would recognize, have all left this world. They are living the life after that day. Everyone, life after that day will also come upon us before we know it. Then, shouldn't we start preparing now for that day which will suddenly come upon us? If we are complacent, two months, two years, twenty years will swiftly pass by. From this very moment, we must once again gather our resolve and prepare ourselves for the life that leads to the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus teach us? Since Jesus said, only the one who does the will of Father can enter the kingdom of heaven, 
Let us be the ones who earnestly yearn for the eternal kingdom of heaven with complete faith in God the Father and God the Mother. When God had the Bible written, He left a very important instruction through the Revelation. Let's take a look at the book of Revelation chapter 22. Let's see chapter 22 verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. This scroll refers to the Bible. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the Bible. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. The words of the Bible should never be altered or changed by men. There is a reason it cannot be changed. Doesn't the Bible refer to God as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? The 66 books of the Bible are the words of God. If we think of the words of God as the words of the King, simply speaking, they are a royal decree. Can even a high-ranking official, not just the general public, arbitrarily modify the decree? Absolutely not. That is why the Bible enlightens us that only the one who does the will of Father can be assured of life in the kingdom of heaven after that day. In the past, you and I had all learnt and come to understand that there is only one God. However, upon accepting this truth, we realize that only when there are God the Father and God the Mother, do we become brothers and sisters. Also, isn't it written that the relationship of brothers and sisters is established through the truth of the New Covenant Passover? Let us take a look at the book of Matthew chapter 26 verse 17. Chapter 26 verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate. What is he going to celebrate? The Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Whose will is the Passover? It is also God's will. It has been a long time since people kept the Passover. Since the Passover was abolished at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, no church has observed it until now, except our Church of God. The Passover is what Jesus commanded his disciples to observe. Let's move on to verse 26. Let's take a look at the scene of keeping the Passover. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Jesus said that the Passover bread is his holy body. Let's see verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This. The Passover wine, is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we keep the Passover, we inherit God's flesh and blood. Children are those who inherit the flesh and blood of their parents. Then, what must those who have the right and the privilege to call God, Father, and Mother, have through the Passover? Shouldn't they have God's blood of life within them? This is why Jesus commanded us to keep the Passover, and expressed his earnest heart, saying, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. What covenant did he even describe the Passover as? He said, this is the new covenant. He meant, this is a covenant that will never disappear, never fade away, and never vanish. 
By saying this, didn't he grant us the truth of the new covenant Passover as the everlasting covenant? Today, you and I revere Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. God has granted the spiritual blood, which is thicker than the physical blood, among the beloved brothers and sisters in Zion. Hence, looking at John chapter 13 verse 34, what else has God given us as a command? He said, a new command I give you. What should we do? He said, love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples. Everyone, every word has its significance and all words carry God's will. Let us not forget this and properly carry out God's will so that we can all return to the eternal kingdom of heaven. We must prepare for life after the day. After that day, who will be able to enjoy life in the kingdom of heaven and who are deemed worthy to enter it? Who can enter the kingdom of heaven? Only the one who does the will of Father can enter there. Today, I would like to ask all our gracious brothers and sisters to deeply engrave in our minds all the teachings of Bible given to us once more. By following the will of father and mother with obedience, let us swiftly find our lost brothers and sisters, who are longing for father, mother, and Zion, and guide them into the truth. Hoping that all the moments today will become a blessed time, building beautiful milestones on the journey to the kingdom of heaven. I would like to conclude the sermon. Thank you very much.